Today, I want to talk about sex and gender and how the two relate um, from the perspective of a scientist, which I am, who turned into sort of a philosopher. But before I go too far, I want to tell a story about growing up. And I admit it's going to start off a little bit sad, but but it, it gets better toward the end because you see back in the olden days, which was after Woodstock ended, but actually long before Star Wars was ever in theaters, a baby girl was born. And what was strange about this baby girl is that her parents were not even aware that she was born, which is not because her mother was completely unconscious or her father had gotten lost somewhere in Siberia. It was because a doctor looked at the baby girl's anatomy when she was born. And from the anatomy, the doctor made a decision about the baby girl's identity that would make the rest of her life very difficult because the doctor typed a single letter M on the little girl's birth certificate. And that doesn't seem like much because it wasn't even the letter itself that made the baby girl's life difficult. It was everything else that goes along with a letter M because the baby girl knew she was a girl. But that letter M made her parents, her community, her government think she was a boy. And that girl, she wanted to play Barbies with the other girls, but she was told those types of things weren't for her. And from that, she learned she wasn't good enough for the things girls do. But when she tried to do the things people said she was supposed to do, she wasn't any good at them. and Nobody wanted to play with her. So... From that, she learned she wasn't good enough for the things boys do either. And it didn't help that her father was abusive and her mother was distant because from that, from everything, the girl learned she really wasn't good for anything. So the little girl wasn't very happy. And then she reached puberty. She learned about the things that growing humans are supposed to know, but her body changed and it looked wrong. It felt wrong. Everything was wrong. And she tried as hard as she could, but no matter how she tried, it was wrong. So she wanted to hurt herself because that alone seemed right. And she tried to end it several times, really. But there was one thing that kept the girl going, and that was learning how things worked. So she applied herself in school, and she did her best to ignore the people who called her a boy, and she was successful, and kind of successful. When the little girl finished school and found a job, she made money. But she found if she would just agree with those people who insisted on calling her a boy, she could make much more money. So. She agreed, and the man she became buried that girl deep inside where nobody could find her, not even himself. And then the man found out he was going to be a father. He was going to have his own baby, and that baby was going to be a boy. Well, the man didn't know what he was going to do, but he did know. He still didn't understand boys. And when his son was born, the man was sure about one thing. He was going to bury that little girl inside even deeper because boys need fathers and fathers are men. Fathers are not little girls. And as he tried so hard to forget about that little girl, the man slowly died inside. That is until he was so broken, he just couldn't go on. And then his family reminded him about the little girl that still peeked out occasionally. And his family reminded him that little girl needed love and they wanted to love her. So the dying man set her free. And the little girl became everything she was ever supposed to become. Now I realize everything she was ever supposed to become is a bit vague. I am Amethysta Herrick. I have a background in biology, especially genetics, which interested me from a very early age. I went on to complete a PhD 
in analytical chemistry, where I learned about gathering and processing data, statistical methods, ex experimental design, things like that. And after graduate school, I had a 25-year career in technology, where I worked from being an engineer all the way up to being a manager, executive management, but I've always been interested in how things work. And so on my own, I've studied psychology and philosophy and sociology, because all of this contributes to knowing more about the world and why it is the way it is, because I want to know why I am the way I am. I began gender transition in 2022 after a lifetime of knowing that I must, but believing I couldn't. And when I began hormone therapy, I experienced very significant cognitive changes. I realized I really hadn't felt emotions other than anger. And I realized that my relationship with physical pain was not normal. It was not just a high pain tolerance. And I also found an equanimity that almost a decade of meditation and spiritual practice had not brought. And when I realized all this, I realized I had to begin research on myself. And if I was going to begin research on myself, I had to begin research on my community. And when I'd done that, I had to share what I learned. And so that's why I'm here today, to share what I've learned. I want to start off not by talking about sex or gender, but to consider a similar model there is a reason for this detour. I want to demonstrate that what we perceive, what we experience, doesn't necessarily have to be scientifically accurate. So I want to start off by thinking about spheres, a red sphere, a blue sphere. But what does it mean to be red or blue? And to answer this question, we're going to take one more detour, this time into physics, the visible light spectrum. You can look this up on Wikipedia. The, the visible light spectrum is a range of wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum particular to human sight, particular to human experience. But to the typical human, it's not really anything we think about. The exact wavelengths don't make a difference, although we know there are social aspects to color. For instance, I grew up in Southern California, and something that I called blue, somebody in the Southeast would, might call green. We also know there's a biological aspect. Some of us perceive color differently. But we do understand that all of the colors have a relationship to each other. And if you're familiar with that Roy G. Biv acronym, you know also that red wavelengths are always longer than blue wavelengths. Now, physicists don't do well with vague definitions. What they see is a well-laid-out spectrum here. Colors to a physicist correspond to well-defined ranges of wavelengths. And so if we were to vary wavelength from long wavelengths on the left to short wavelengths on the right, we're going to find that at some point, physicists, physicists consider the light to be red, and then at some point, not red. And similarly, at some point, the light is considered blue and then not blue. And the important point to take here is that Different wavelengths of light are given different names, but the, the names of the colors are words, only words. They are labels that physicists use to classify colors that objects appear based on the, the wavelength of the light. So if we go back to reality here, I'm talking about light. I'm not talking about spheres. Why? Because objects appear colored because light is reflected from it. An object that appears red does so by reflecting red light and absorbing other light. An object that appears blue does so by reflecting blue light and absorbing other light. Well, with this model in mind, I'd like to become a junior physicist here. Let's run some experiments, see how this model holds up. If we take our red and blue sphere and we put them in sunlight, we see a red and blue sphere. Yippee for our side, I guess. But if we filter that sunlight so that only red light comes through, now we'll see a red sphere, but then we see the blue sphere appears gray. That's odd. And then if we filter the sunlight so that only blue light comes through, now our blue sphere looks blue again, but now the red sphere looks gray. This is a bummer, but actually it gets a lot more complicated because light doesn't just come in red, white, and blue. Light can be mixed with abandon. And let's say we filter the light so that purple comes through, both red and blue. 
Now we're going to find that the spheres appear red and blue, but maybe they're muted colors. And if we filter the light so that only yellow comes through, now both spheres appear gray. Well, what is the result that we're getting from this experiment? The primary result that we get is that color is not an intrinsic property of an object. Intrinsic means a property that's caused by the object itself. So something you would observe independent of experimental conditions. But that is not what we've observed. We've observed that objects only have the potential to appear a particular color. And the color that they appear depends on the context, depends on the type of light illuminating the object. And so now it's an appropriate question to ask, well, what then is a color? A color is a definition by physicists of a range of wavelengths in relationship to other wavelengths. And all of these relationships are based upon empirical properties of the human eye. Now, the conclusions that we would draw about color is that the physics definition is scientifically accurate, but it, it certainly isn't very romantic. And if we want to talk about running toward our lover in a verdant meadow, it, we'd have to change it to running toward our lover in a meadow that reflects light and the range of wavelengths. And that's just awful. But this is why humans apply labels. Humans take that technical label and apply it to objects for convenience. It is not accurate. It is not scientifically accurate, but it is much more convenient. The point to take from this is that an object is not a color, and a color is not an object. And really, the takeaway should be that common usage of a concept certainly doesn't affect whether or not we're using it accurately. Nature has always been happy to ignore human convenience regardless of how much we really want her not to. So now that we've spoken about colors, I want to apply the model slightly differently. I want to talk about reproduction. There are two types of reproduction. The first is called asexual reproduction. In this, only one parent participates in creating offspring. The corollary of that is that the offspring only receives traits from one parent. On the uh, converse, there is sexual reproduction in which at least two parents participate in creating offspring with the corollary being that offspring receive trait, receives the traits from parents in a semi-random distribution. And this semi-random distribution occurs through the combination of special cells called gametes. Now, let me define two terms here. First, I, I use the word trait. And a trait is any characteristic of an organism. It could be the species of the organism. It could be physical structure. It could be biochemistry. And then gametes. Gametes, as I said, are very special cells. Only sexually reproducing species create them. And when they combine, they form what's called a zygote. And that zygote turns into a fetus, which turns into, in humans anyway, which grows into an offspring. Gametes are very interesting. It turns out that gametes come in many sizes. But gamete size, fun fact, is not related to organism size. Like mouse gametes happen to be larger than elephant gametes, but each species that's been observed in nature so far has a characteristic set of gamete sizes. Most species only have two gamete sizes. This is not universal, but it, it's, it's close. It's near universal. There's a, a handful of species observed in nature that have more than two gamete sizes. In the binary, usually what we observe is you have one that is three or more orders of magnitude larger than the other. Now to the typical human, just like in color, we don't really care about the size of each gamete. But just like red and blue, the gametes are related, this time not by wavelength, but by size. They have a, rev a relation to relationship to each other, and the relationship is important. And biologists distinguish and name these gametes by the relative size where the sperm is the smaller of the two gametes, and the ovum is the larger of the two gametes. Now, biologists are, are better with, with vague definitions than physicists, but still not very good at it. And they see, again, a spectrum of size of gametes. And if we were to look from small gamete on the left to large gamete on the right, and scroll, you know, and change the size of the gametes, we're going to find within one species that a gamete would be considered a sperm, and then 
not a sperm. And then similarly, if that gamete got larger, we would find a point where the gamete is considered an ovum and then considered not an ovum. The point here, again, is that different sizes of gametes are given different names, but again, these names are words, only words. They're labels that biologists use to classify organisms that can reproduce into groups, and that's just based on the size of gamete produced. Now, if we go back to biology here once again, I'm talking about gamete size, I'm not talking about sex or gender, but there is a reason for this. Because an organism is labeled with a sex, it's grouped into a, a group called a sex by its size of gamete. And in those, those groups are, are very obvious. It's a group of organisms that create small gametes. These are labeled male. And the group of organisms that create larger gametes are labeled female. So just like we were junior physicists, I'd like to become a junior biologist. Let's test this uh, model and see how it holds up. If we think about gamete production, let's say we have a set of parents. That set of parents has children. Look at that. Looks like gametes work the way we figured. Yippee for our side again. But wait, let's think about the children. They have not reached sexual maturity. They do not produce gametes. If gamete production is how you get classified into a group that's called a sex, are they male or female? And actually, dang, the grandparents, it turns out, are past sexual maturity. They're not making these anymore. Are they male and female? They were once making gametes, but now they're not. And unfortunately, just like with color, it gets more complicated because genetics is messy. Gamete combination is unpredictable. We have observed intersex genetic characteristics. We have observed organisms that produce no gametes. We have observed organisms that produce them both. And in nature, far more than just uh, the human species, we found plenty of organisms that produce the same gametes, but will engage in the act of sex with each other. And there are always, of course, organisms that lose the ability to produce gametes, whether by accident or age or, say, gender-affirming surgery. Well, what are some results that we can pull out of this experiment? It's that sex is not an intrinsic property of an organism. And to return to the word intrinsic, it is a property caused by the individual organism. It is something you observe independent of experimental conditions, and that is not what we've just observed. We've observed that organisms have only a potential to produce gametes. And the gamete that they produce and whether or not they do it depends on context. It depends on their own genetics, it depends on sexual maturity, may depend on any other factors. So then what really is a sex? Like a color, a sex is a definition by biologists of a range of gamete sizes in relationship to other gametes. And all of these based upon empirical properties of only the species under consideration. Well, conclusions we can draw here. Sort of like with the color, the, bio the biologist's definition of sex is necessarily accurate, is scientifically accurate, necessarily abstract. Because sex is a species level characteristic. It doesn't really apply at the individual level. However, humans will apply that technical label to organisms. And this is done again for convenience. It is scientifically inaccurate and also the source of the fallacy that sex is related or even could be related to other properties of the individual organism. The takeaway I want you to take is an organism is not a sex, and a sex is not an organism. Now let's talk about gender. I wanted to wait for a moment because I wanted to divorce the biology of a species from the expression of an individual. Now it's time to discuss a definition of gender that's in line with the model I just presented. But first, let's review the models. As I've, as I've presented, neither color nor sex is intrinsic. Neither color nor sex is caused by the object being observed, and both color and sex depend up on the conditions when you observe the object or the organism. However, both color and sex are used commonly as labels. And this may be convenient, 
but it is still scientifically accurate. And to recap, just because a word has common use, it certainly doesn't guarantee that as we use it, we're using it accurately. So let's talk about the distinction between sex and gender. If sex is a species level context sensitive characteristic, if sex is not about individuals, what the hell does each of us have? Well, what each of us has is an individual expression of our physical structure, our biochemistry, the thoughts we have, the behavior that we exhibit. And it turns out biology already has a word for that. And that word is gender. Gender is the individual level expression of sex characteristics as manifested in the reality, as biology, as cognition, as behavior within a context. And that context is the social environment of the organism. Now, how does this definition play out in nature? Turns out we have some great examples. There is a species of fish in the Great Barrier Reef. And in fact, there are a few uh, species um, that we've observed. And each organism of that species is born capable of producing either gamete. So either it could produce sperm, could produce ova. And the sex, the gamete that each organism produces depends upon the social order because it turns out there's only one male in the social order at any one time. When that male dies, one of the other females actually changes sex, changes the gamete that she produces to sperm and now has become the male. So if we were to generalize now the idea of gender for all of nature, sex is a potential to participate in an act of reproduction. And all of this is based on the characteristics of the species that we observe. But gender is the actual participation in a single act of reproduction based on individual characteristics as well as social characteristics. Sex is a potential, gender is an implementation. Now, as I've spoken about this and written about this in many articles, I usually get some sort of pushback. There's usually a rebellion from a group of people who believe that humans shouldn't really be considered part of nature. And in fact, this is summed up by the quote that I have as a title, where somebody said, yeah, but I'm not a fish. P probably not. I mean, go good on you for recognizing that. And I will absolutely admit, human society is very likely to be more complicated than fish society. It doesn't take a lot of, of observation to see human gender is obviously nuanced. We differ in body shape, clothes, makeup we choose, hairstyle. We differ in blood concentrations of hormones. We differ in what we believe, whom we love, whom we hate. We differ in what we would love what we, or what we desire, what, we, what motivates us, our ideal situation. And finally, we differ in the day-to-day -day expression of all of the above as we exist in our social environments. So let's talk about human gender. How does, the, how does this model of sex versus gender apply to humans? And what I want to do is review first existing gender theory. And I want to do this as a lead-in to discuss my own original theory of gender. So firmly in the corner of biological essentialism, we have the current anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. And this is summed up by the phrase that sex is gender and sexuality. That one letter, a doctor is going to type one letter based on the most obvious anatomy, and that's going to dictate your future. It's going to set your identity for life your sex, your gender, your sexuality. Now, the issue, the primary issue, is that human experience clearly extends past biology. It doesn't take a lot of observation, again, to see that biochemistry or homo hormonal balance can change cognition, can change our, our feelings. Each of us at least has the appearance of having free will and personal choice. And finally, this idea completely dismisses the effect that social environment can, in, can exert on each of us. So firmly in the corner of social relativism, 
is the theory called performativity. And this is the theory originally put forth by Judith Butler um, in the 1990s. It starts off with the idea that gender roles are social constructs, which is a, a philosophical term for saying that as the society uses, begins to use a label and accepts it as a, as, as a common vocabulary term, it constructs the concept and the meaning behind the words. What this means is that gender roles are defined by for us by the social environment. And there are pluses and minuses to this. The big plus is that if gender roles are, are a derivative of the social environment, it means that constant reinforcement is necessary, which allows gender roles to change as we've observed them through the centuries, throughout human history. The negative to this is, is the idea that we cannot experience or even understand what sex is. And while I agree we do not experience the species level characteristic of sex, there is absolutely an understanding and a definition for what sex is. The major issue that I have with performativity is that we are more than our social environment. This diminishes the extent to which each of us can contribute to our own identity. And just as identity extends past biology, identity extends past philosophy, language, society, we would have our identity even if we existed on a desert island. So somewhere in the middle between biology and sociology is a theory called observable aggregates. And observable aggregates was originally developed by Simone de Beauvoir and has since been, been greatly expanded. But it begins with functional roles that are defined by anatomy. So if you have big muscles, you ought to go be a hunter. If you got small muscles, you ought to go be a gatherer. But gender ends up being a combination, not just of your functional role, but also the interactions you have within a society. And so as a result, you end up with this checklist of characteristics. And if you can check enough boxes with your muscles and your social interactions, you become the gender as a result of that aggregate. Now, the issue that I see is that the line gets blurred at cosmetic differences. Cosmetic. Because what about our minds? What about our cognition? Certainly that informs social interaction, but we can suppress certain interactions. And if we look only at uh, cosme uh, the cosmetic properties of an organism, do we have to consider are they functional? If somebody stuffs a bra, does that person become a woman? And then furthermore, if you stuff a bra on you and appear to have breasts, is that characteristics characteristic of a gender? Are the differences that we can that we can observe what defines a gender? What if we become surgically altered, accidentally changed? What happens? There is a, a fourth theory, sort of, that I call ancillary aggregates. And this is the, the idea that gender derives from more subtle biological characteristics than the most obvious anatomy. This is usually these ideas um, come out of research that, that is not intended to explore gender, but Rather, you know, they get observed and, and um, it's kind of interesting. And, and I've seen these be picked up by the transgender community, at least, where we observe hormonal balances. We've also observed brain structure sometimes appears to, to, to correspond to gender, even neural oscillation. And if you want to go really far, we could think about intersex characteristics or even how gene expression is turned on and off through epigenetics, which usually is environmentally driven. Now, I think each of these, the issue is that each of these ends up as an extension of the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. And I think it's subject to the same criticism that identity extends past biology. And I believe nobody needs to take a test in order to define who they are. So, I'm now ready to discuss my own gender theory. You may ask, why did you make something like this up? Well, I'm a scientist. I was taught that the word theory is, is something that explains all phenomena, and I don't think any 
of the three or four that I just presented explains all of human experience. And all of them do what I believe is conflate a proposed origin with its observed implementation. What does that mean? Well, let's return again to intrinsic properties. When we define color, what do we see? We see that although color is related to human light, it is certainly not defined by it. It's defined by wavelengths. Our experience of color is individual. Our experience is intrinsic, but it is not the origin. And then similarly, when we define gender, what do we observe? Again, we see that gender is related to the human experience, but it is not defined by it. We observe gender across all nature. Our experience of gender is individual. Our experience is intrinsic, but gender as a whole is not. The origin is not. So the limitations that I see in, existing, in the existing gender theories, with the current anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, it's pretty obvious. Genetics may be the origin of physical human traits, including gamete production, but what each of us has is an individual genetic combination. We have an implementation. With performativity, you need to have a society that exists before the concept and meaning of gender make sense. Although social environment is the origin of social norms, what each of us experiences is our individual behavior and language as an implementation. If you were to look at observable aggregates, that actually suffers from both issues. The biology is not predictable and gender extends, exists outside of human behavior. And all of these existing lines of thought imply that gender is like a possession. It's something we're given or something we inherit. But I do not see gender as a possession. I see gender as a mediator which is to say that each of us has an individual and private experience of, a, of our social environment. And then each of us has an individual and private knowledge of the person we are, what I've chosen to call the origin of identity. Gender then becomes an ongoing process of mediation. It's a negotiation between the person we know we are and what we feel safe enough expressing within our social environment. So stick that into words. Gender as a mediator implies an ongoing and individual process of negotiation that occurs between the person we know we are through our origin of identity and the level of safety that we feel expressing who that person is within the context of our social environment and the norms that exist within it. Well, how does this process work? Each of us on a daily basis tests our self-expression within our social environment. In particular, we, we ask ourselves, who do we know we are? What does our origin of identity tell us we must be? But just as important is, what are the expectations put on us? What can we get away with? And when the social environment rejects our attempts at self-expression, what we experience is gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a tool that the social environment uses. And the, this tool is not atypical. It is natural and typical. This is just how humans develop. It so happens that when, when we are corrected, many people will allow themselves to be corrected. And just like in the performativity theory, what that does is allow social norms to be reinforced. We can maintain a cultural identity. But there are those of us who will not be corrected, and those people allow the social environment to evolve past social norms that have become outdated. And the result of mediation is a snapshot of our current physical, cognitive, and behavioral characteristics. It is our current gender identity, but it was not our first, and it will not be our last gender identity. So what benefits, benefits do I see in the mediator theory? First and foremost, the mediator theory does not consider the origin of identity. The origin could be biochemical, genetic, psychological, spiritual. 
It could be any combination of the th of those whatsoever. What we what what the um, origin of identity is acknowledged as is something that doesn't change, at least not rapidly, not within the lifetime of a human being. But we know who we are, and that identity is not capricious. What the mediator theory also does is does not dismiss the impact of social environment. We all know that politics can change, fashion can change, social environments change, because we're not the only members. But the mediator theory acknowledges that while the social environment may change, it doesn't necessarily change us. Go back to the idea of the origin of identity. From a greater scientific standpoint, the mediator theory provides a much better evolution of human society because uh, critics of, of the LGBTQ community just love to bring up the idea, why are there still homosexual relationships? If there's no reproduction, how does this keep on coming down through the species? But it's pretty obvious. Gender is not heritable because gender is an individual level expression of sex characteristics. And as I presented the model before, that's just the way nature is. It brings human ba humans back into nature, not outside it. We are part of it. But an Im immutable origin of identity actually believes that we were born this way. This is the way we were intended to be. And thinking about these things, thinking about identity, thinking about gen gender is not atypical. We're not strange for considering it. Not at all. Because gender and identity are normal aspects of human development. Every person on the planet, every human who is born, must engage in the process of gender. And the process never ends. Every human continually experiences and develops their identity and gender throughout life. So let's talk about this human experience. Draw some conclusions. The process of identity is not simple. It's, it's very complicated. Each one of us is an individual who has a complex of characteristics from physical to cognitive to behavioral to spiritual, but all of these must be expressed within a greater social environment. And it is not a matter of either or. It is not body versus mind, not individual versus collective. It's not human against human. It has to be both and. Each of us has to be able to express ourselves within our social environments because identity is a universal human experience. Identity is universal. Every human has to go through this, find out what to express. And some of us, the lucky ones, the fortunate ones, we will live as the person we know we are. And some of us, the less fortunate ones, are going to accept the person who gets recommended by default by the social environment. But make no mistake, you're going to end up with an identity and you're going to end up with a gender. So what's the result of this process? People who think about themselves and accept themselves live happier lives. When you have to consider and accept who you are, you're able to engage with your life confidently. You're able to engage completely. You act with confidence. But it turns out people who accept themselves also accept others. When you have considered and accepted yourself, you expect others to do the same. There's a confirmation bias on what we already believe, but other expression is more easily accepted. We understand that there is a whole spectrum of human experience, and all of this ends as a no-lose situation. When each individual is happier, the social environment as a whole is more harmonious. And so, this is what has turned into my mission. This is what I do. My mission is twofold, and is derived from the theory of identity and gender that I've just presented. The first arm of my mission is that identity is our birthright. Identity is not the domain of society. Who we are cannot belong to anybody else. The other arm of my mission is that discovering 
who we are and manifesting it in our lives right here, right now, today, not tomorrow, today. It is our highest moral obligation. It is the purpose of human life. It's what we were brought here to do. And so with this, I've done what I was brought here to do. And I've explained my theory of identity and gender. I hope you would like to engage more with my theories, engage more with me. If you do, there's a QR code there. My personal website, which has links to all of my social media networks. You can find that at amethysta.io. And then if you want to read the work that I do and, and many other contributors, you can find that at Gender Identity Today. There's a QR code. And you can find it at the URL genderidentitytoday.com. Well, with that... You've made it through this entire presentation, so I will say thank you for your experience. Uh, thank you for your attention. That was great. Um, thank this, you. This is last time, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's always. I'm really glad you did this again for us because it's always good to like refresh ourselves on these things, and I really do. I I got to pay more attention this time because I wasn't like in the middle of a 24 hour screen live stream. <laughs> right. I was able to like actually like zone in and pay attention a little bit more this time. And um, I'm probably even gonna watch it again because I feel like, I don't feel smart enough to understand it once or twice through. I need to listen to it a couple times before it like actually seeps in. I also have raging ADHD, but um, I really <laughs> like the, the mediation theory, the, yeah, I, it makes sense to me from what Thank I you. believe I understand from it. It makes sense. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting to me. And and I mean, I, I got this when I first started my own transition. You know, I, I heard many, many people say, well, gender, of course, is a, so, is a social construct. And I said, what does that mean to you? And most people go, I don't know, <laughs> which is a fair, but you know, the idea that, that gender roles are, are constructed because it's, it's just what we observe. It's what we accept. Like that idea is not actually new. And it goes back actually to the 16th century. I believe it is Michel Foucault. I'm horrible with French, but um, who, who originally proposed that scientific concepts, believe it or not, are social constructs. The idea that, you know, if you, if enough people believe that something is truth, it becomes truth. Yeah. So, Much so it's like interesting. Earth is flat. Um, everyone accepted it as true. So it became true. <laughs> right. For a group of people. So yeah, that makes sense. So so it is interesting, you know, th there's a lot of thought that, that I believe Judith Butler put into all of their, all of their theory, all of their work. And, and I do not mean to diminish anything Butler has done, you know, for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is, I think, um, kind of incumbent on the rest of us to figure out, you know, what does this mean in implementation? And, and, uh, you know, I think we've, we've, <laughs> It's easy to dismiss just to say, well, if what I believe is that sex means gender, then how is that? How am I wrong? And it's like, hmm, fair enough. It's a good, you know, good question. So, yeah. And for some people, their gender aligns perfectly with their sex. And that's, that's the norm, actually. That is what most people, I think, experience. Um, I wonder. Honestly, I, I wonder as well wonder. sometimes, but if if we had a completely accepting society and there was no hatred towards trans people, I wonder how many more would step outside of that binary. I think a lot. Um, this idea of mediation, I, ha I have an example. Um, at one point, you know, my son, I don't even know where he got the skirt. It was an amazing, like... Uh, teal sequined like stretchy skirt i don't know i don't know where they got it i think i called them he and i apologize uh but they were going to wear it to like this holiday program at school 
And at the time, they would have been in kindergarten. So puts on the skirt, comes out, says, hey, I'm going to wear this, you know, to the program. And I said, yeah, live it up. You know, why not? By the time all the all the children came out to um, to, you know, do the singing, whatever it is they did, our kid was not wearing the skirt. So when when, you know, we collected them at the end of the, the program, I said, what happened to the skirt? And, and they said, well, I got there and the other guy said, I'm not supposed to wear a skirt. So I took it off. And I said, does it bother you? And they said, no, not really. And I thought, wow, like that was one of the beginnings of where I went, what the hell does that mean? Because like it would have bothered me. Right. I would have been like, oh, my God, you're telling me from kindergarten by kindergarten. Yeah. But it, but it didn't bother our kid. My point, the point I want to make of this now that I've talked about it for three minutes is just to say, I think many of us, we we don't we're willing to we're willing to explore gender. I mean, I think we are hardwired for exploring gender and identity. I think we have no choice. That's that's just what we do. And if we. There, there are decisions we'll make that just aren't very important to us. Like to our kid, that bit of fashion just wasn't that important. And so when somebody else said, yeah, yeah, take that off, they went, my, took it off. <laughs> so I, I think that's a, I think that's a demonstration of, you know, we, we test our, our self-expression against, you know, the greater social environment. And that's how we, we get corrected or not, you know. Like, I think part of me couldn't think about that as, like, a part of survival. Um, right. Because of the household I was in, it was very homophobic, very anti-trans. I I was I didn't even know what trans was until I was, right. like, on Tumblr at, like, <laughs> 15, 16 years old. Um, and I thought it was bizarre. I was like, this, what is this? Um, and anyways, all that to say, like, I'm thinking back, if, I knew that I didn't like certain types of clothing, but I was just thinking about this the other day. I don't think it was because I didn't like that it was feminine. I don't think I really cared about that. I think I didn't like the texture. Like I didn't like <laughs> dresses, but that's because most of the dresses I was given had tulle on them. Like they oh. would be like like Easter or Christmas dresses. Sure. And that texture is just evil. <laughs> <laughs> I hate scratches it's you up yeah it's awful yeah. and we would have to wear them for a long period of time and they were too floofy and you couldn't like sit down or like i don't know it was uncomfortable i also really don't like i don't mind even now if i found a skirt that went like all the way to my feet i would probably wear it i don't mm -hmm. like how my legs and ankles look when i'm wearing a dress or a skirt that's a really weird thing but like I'm trying to think if someone had told me not to wear something as a kid, I don't, I don't know if I would have cared if they said like, oh, that's this or it's that. I think I would have cared more if they were like, it doesn't look good on you or something. I would have been like, hey. <laughs> sure. I don't know. But you, you did bring up the level of safety that you felt that you certainly were not going to come out in that environment, in that social environment, which, Absolutely. which was Georgia, I believe, right? It was, it was yes. in Georgia. Yeah. Georgia homeschool, Christian evangelical. It, it, it was just a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a recipe for disaster. And, and that's why I think that mediation is so important because, you know, I, I have spoken and I, I'm glad we get the chance to, to discuss this. I've spoken with a lot of people who are not, like out transgender people, people who who will come and say, you know what, am I trans enough? And I go, the that you ask the question already answered it. Like, yes. Well, you know, there, there's you must be, because you answered the question, because you asked the question. But I don't want anybody to think that what I'm trying to propose is that each of us can always be exactly who we are. Safety, of course, always must come first. I mean, you know, you can't, I, I know people who are, who are transgender sex workers in Turkey, and it is very, very dangerous for them. They, every day, they literally go out and put their lives on the line to, to make money 
to, to, you know, to live. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, that mediation is, is, is the, that's the important point. You may know who you, you do know who you are. I'm just ended with that. You do know who you are, but don't get yourself killed, you know, yeah. because there's a better, there's a better place that you can get to. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the level of safety I think is so, is somewhat, um, dismissed you know i know i have seen people who are like look if you're transgender you go transition and it's like mm, really should we say that to brandon tina do yeah. we want to bring him bring up the other people whom we we you know commemorated memorialized last transgender day of remembrance it's not easy it's not easy and it's not something that you should enter into lightly so all of that to say, essentially, <laughs> safety is a big thing, but also some people may really surprise you. You got to yes. gauge it like at your own pace, but some people yeah. may really surprise you. That family in particular really surprised me as, yeah. as like how well they handled it, I guess, for lack of a better word. <laughs> and um, my own family handled it about as badly as I thought they would um, mm. for the most part. And... Yeah, <laughs> but some people will, some people will surprise you probably. I agree. I mean, when I came out, so, I mean, I originally came out to, to people I knew. I mean, I was 23, 24. Yeah, like 23. This was 1994, I guess. Well, it was actually even a little bit earlier, but when I was in graduate, in, interestingly in Georgia. So as I went to University of Georgia for graduate school. And when I came out, uh, you know, at some point, just people were like, hey, you know, you, you seem kind of odd. And I'm like, well, I'm pansexual and transgender. And I didn't have either of those two words, but, you know, said something like that. And I'm, for the most part, what people did was go, yeah, well, you know, it's from California. And like, that was it. Like, it, that was the end of the, the concern. It was, oh, yeah, just wearing a skirt, you know. <laughs> or probably they said he's wearing a skirt. Yeah, he's wearing because they used to have this beautiful velvet, like stretchy skirt. Oh, it was so great. Mm. Yeah, and I know I went to a party and somebody was just like, "Oh, yeah, gosh, from California." So, but but then when I decided to transition, I was actually very surprised by the support that I got, like a good amount of support. And and so, yeah. I'll reiterate what you're saying, Robin, which is that there is an element of safety that we cannot deny don't don't do something stupid that being said i think there are many people who are who will surprise you people whom you think are gonna go oh yeah get out of my life who will just go yeah really may i ask you questions may i understand yeah. this better and you just go yes oh my god yes <laughs> oh, thank <goodness>. you <laughs> right it's, it's one of those things like you go, you, you expect a huge amount of loss and you do usually get a huge amount of loss. There's, I mean, yeah. almost every single person who has transitioned that I've ever talked to has been like, yeah, um, I lost everybody or mm -hmm. I lost a significant number of my friends and family yeah. um, who won't even talk to me anymore and unfriended me on all of the social media platforms, whatever oh, their story may be like, they won't even interact with them anymore. Yeah. And that that's a huge thing to prepare for and again i will continue to say there there are people that really will surprise you right and you right will have no idea until you come out so you try who yeah. you can trust and what i did right. was i i actually this is a longer story for another time but the very basic summary is that i came out and i cut contact with every single person i knew except for like three people and I moved across the country without telling anybody I was leaving. Oh god! And I deleted all of my social media emails. I broke my phone so that they couldn't track me via my SIM card. I left the car behind so oh they couldn't say that like I stole the car. Wow. I literally I left everything, took my ID documents, and moved to another state, and didn't look wow. back. <laughs> and I slowly like how I as I felt safer slowly contacted a handful mm -hmm. of people each month um, from 
most likely to be safe to talk to to least likely to be safe to talk to. And there are people that I still haven't contacted because they're not safe to talk to. And it's been four sure. years now, four. Oh gosh. Four in like two weeks, I think. Yeah, five years, almost five years. So it's been five years since I've talked to most of my family. Wow. Um, we're still not safe to talk to. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so if... <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying that's the best way to do it. Um, I definitely stressed a lot of people out um, that maybe didn't need that stress. Um, but, you know, if that's how you've got to do it, that's how you got to do it. Like, yeah, slowly reintroduce yeah. yourself to people in a safe way. Um, and you could probably do that without doing everything I did. There was a whole lot of other reasons why I did it that way. But, um, yeah. I mean, there's, if anybody needs any tips on how to delete yourself <laughs> from the world um, <laughs> and move somewhere else without people knowing, I got you. Yeah, send a note. Exactly. But, send an email. <laughs> you, you know, though, I mean, there, for what it's worth, I mean, we, we face a lot of ridicule. We face a lot of hate. We face sometimes even danger from those who who should love us anyway and i don't know about you robin but i think i can say beyond a shadow of a doubt this has all been worth it for me oh absolutely everything that i have done was for the betterment of myself and my mental health yeah and yes i mean i look back and there there are things i wish i still had that i gave up to transition yeah um, but I gained safety in so many ways. And yeah. because of that, I am now here in California instead of Georgia. And I have an amazing job with amazing coworkers in the art industry. And this is just, I mean, it opened me up to be able to create this nonprofit and all of these things that would not have happened at all. If I had stayed where I was, I would have, I was on track to become a psychologist, therapist. Hmm. I was like my major um, and I was like one year away from completing it. So I guess I could go back and finish that out if I really wanted to, but I don't. Um, I was on track to be a closeted <laughs> straight woman with right. um, my high school sweetheart that we had been together for 10 years. We wanted to have like so many kids. And oh my gosh. I, I see that path that I could have taken and I know now that I just I would not have been happy and it was bound to implode sooner or later and I'm glad mm -hmm. I changed my direction when I did because yeah. it hurt so much and it only would have hurt more if I kept going right and I think everyone just has to make those decisions for themselves but to mm -hmm. answer your question yes it's all been worth it and despite all of the hurt it's amazing <laughs> It's right. amazing that we have now, you know. I think if you had not done it then, you would have ended up 52 years old like I was, a man waiting to die, as opposed to now two years later, yeah. a woman gearing up to live. Yeah. So I keep on bringing the room down. Jeez, what the hell? <laughs> Is there something? <laughs> We're both like about to start crying. <laughs> We're like, anyways. Is so my gravy in here? I'm gonna go get a stiff drink. Oh goodness. <laughs> it's good to have these conversations, though. Like, it's important, especially like trans person to trans person. Like, we are the only people who will understand each other. Like, cis people. You know, gay yeah. people, they, they only get so much of it. Yeah. And they can right. only relate so much. It's so important to continue having conversations amongst ourselves yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I think anybody can understand gender dysphoria because I think everybody experiences it. Like, as I, that was, I think, what happens to my kids, you know, with the skirt and then the, the other kids say, no, nah, don't wear that. And there was probably a moment or two where maybe our kid was like, oh, dang, because it was like nice teal sequins. But... But it, it went away quickly. So I think each of us can understand the idea of not fulfilling a social role, but the idea of never being capable of fulfilling a social role is certainly more rarefied. 